All right, and hello, 102 students. You just got done taking your first exam, and uh, congratulations on that. Uh, I thought I'd run through the solutions here and make a little video so you can kind of self-grade yourself before I even get a chance to do it. I'll start working on them uh, this weekend. But uh, if you wanted to, to kind of skim through this and get an idea of uh, the solutions and uh, what your score will be, um, maybe this will help. Um, or maybe you have some questions. But hopefully it'll be a learning opportunity either way. Um, remember the multiple choice are worth uh, two points each year. So I'll, I'll begin here. It says, how many millimeters are in one kilometer? Um, well, there's a lot of ways to do this problem. Uh, maybe I'll start by just writing one kilometer here. Um, let's see, how does that show up on the, on the screen? Maybe I'll do a little darker. I hate to write in pen, but it... Uh, might uh, show up a little better. All right, so let's start with one kilometer. And uh, yeah, I like the way that looks a little better. Uh, maybe on a big screen it would look okay, but I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, one kilometer. Um, and of course, we know the uh, symbolism for a kilometer, a kila, and as I tried to say, it's not km for kilometer, it's k for kila and m for meter. So the kilo is a thousand, so that's a thousand meters. Um, of course, then another option a after this is to take the 1,000, and we want this to look like uh, a milla, and so maybe I'll put a 10 to the minus 3 and a 10 to the minus 3 uh, together. That, of course, doesn't change anything, except what it does allow me to do is it allows me to write this as a millimeter, and so that's what the first M in millimeter stands for. And then I have a thousand divided by a thousandth, and so that makes 10 to the six, and so that's a million, so that would be D. So D as in dog is the, is the first one. Uh, number two, uh, which of the following is equal to uh, 86,400 seconds? That's uh, four decimal places, so it would be 8.64 times 10 to the four times 10,000, and so that would be B, B as in boy there. Uh, here's a fancy one on units, probably not common units, that was the whole point. Uh, it says if there are eight furlongs in one mile, uh, so a furlong is an eighth of a mile, how fast in miles per hour can a horse run if it completes a 12 furlong race in two minutes? So the first thing is to say, okay, distance, which is 12 furlongs, and divided by two minutes. So the first part of this problem is a little bit of a, of a question about, you know, what is, what is speed here? And uh, so distance divided by time. But then the main part of this question is really about now converting those units. Uh, and so why don't we convert a furlong into a mile? And uh, one of the first things to do is to say, you know, if you multiplied it by one, kind of like I, I did up here, uh, this was, you know, the same number over the same number, although I changed it to a symbol over a number, uh, I could do the same thing here. I wouldn't change the speed. This is the speed if I multiplied it by something like this, one mile, uh, which is equal to eight furlongs. Uh, because a mile and eight furlongs are the same thing, they're equal. So this is just multiplying by one. So you don't change anything. Except what you do do is you then have a unit conversion and you switch it from furlongs to miles. And so that would make um, miles per minute right now. And so the next logical step is to do the same thing here. And again, don't uh, change it, in other words, multiply it by just the number one, and we could write this then in terms of a minute is equal to then 60 seconds. So again, the numerator and the denominator are, are equal, so we're not, we're not changing anything um, in terms of the numbers and the meaning of the speed. We, we, we started right and, and, and with the speed, and we didn't change it. We multiplied by one, and we multiplied by one, but we multiplied it by what I call a creative one, so that when we're left here, we're left with miles per second. And we're not even asked to actually do the calculation. Uh, and so scanning these, it looks like they all start off right at 12 furlongs per minute. But the 
first one, well, we can rule that out. It gives us two meters. Uh, this one's looking good. Uh, this one's looking, no, this one's backwards, so we can rule that one out. Uh, miles, well, that one's looking good too. Oh, but that one's got a mistake. So there it is, right, right there. And so number three would be B as in, in boy there. Okay, uh, moving on to number four. Uh, the speed in, the speed of three meters per second is approximately what? So again, if I go three meters per second, and I want to switch this to a kilometer, um, now, I'll do a little different. I could multiply by one, but another nice way of doing this is three meters per second, and then you exactly replace what a, a meter is. Uh, we know that there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. And so if you move the 1,000 to the other side, then a meter is what we're left with. And so one kilometer divided by a 1,000 is what a meter is equal to. And so that's a kind of a direct substitution. I can do the same thing with my second. So I'll put 60 seconds is equal to a, oh, I'm sorry, we want hour. So let's change that, 60 times 60. So 3,600 seconds is equal to one hour. Or dividing it by 3,600, we got a second equal to an hour over 3,600. So doing a direct substitution, a second is equal to an hour over 3,600. And maybe that's not better because that's a compound fraction. Um, but fortunately, looking at my units, I've got kilometers per hour. So that's the units. Uh, but this I've got to flip and put on the top. So this would be 3 times 3,600. And then this would be the bottom, and that's a 1,000. That's uh, so, what does that come out to be? 3 times 3,600 divided by 1,000. When I grab my calculator, and 10.8, and it looks like uh, the closest is a C there. And so, C would be the answer for number uh, 4. Uh, moving along here, number 5. It says, a car travels from milepost... 343 to 349. So that's an increase of six miles. Okay, so it went six miles and it did this in five minutes. Now, car B travels from mile post 493 to 499. Now, again, that's a six mile increase and it did it in the same time uh, which has, car has the greater average speed well average speed is uh, just distance divided by time and we're doing the same numbers we're doing six divided by five so I don't even need to actually calculate it I can just say that their their average speeds are are going to be the the same and so there's C uh, six, uh, which of the following could be a velocity? Now, remember the difference between speed and velocity is that velocity is the ma has a magnitude, which is its speed, but then also a direction. And um, let's see. The appropriate units would be meters per second. So we could rule out A. doesn't have meters per second. Um, B and C look good, but C is the one with a direction on it. And so we could rule out B, and then this doesn't have a direction, so it must be C. Uh, number seven, an object is accelerating. Uh, now remember, a definition of accelerate is change in velocity. And coming back here, velocity is either speed or word direction. So if either one of those changed its speed, so there's A, or its direction, and so when speed or direction changes would be the correct answer for C. Uh, number eight, uh, we have a ping pong ball and a golf ball. They're approximately the same size, so maybe I'll put a little G over here for a golf ball and a little P over here for a ping pong ball. And they have approximately the same size, but definitely different masses. 
uh, which hits the ground first if you drop them simultaneous from a building. In this case, do not ignore air resistance. So when we first did this in class, we said, okay, if you ignore air resistance, they have the same, and so they would hit simultaneously. So that's a tempting answer, but it doesn't really fit the question. It says, do not ignore. Okay, so that's when our free body diagram comes in, and the golf ball weighs more, so there's a bigger force. Um, of course, there's also less mass on the ping pong ball. So at first, when there is no resistance, when it's not moving, um, the lower force on the ping pong ball together with the lower mass of the ping pong ball give me the same results as 9.8. So that's the acceleration, again, with there's no friction. And that's the acceleration would be if we ignored air friction all the way down. But this one gets a little harder because we must include it. So if they started moving with a little bit of speed, and so maybe I'll just say maybe the same as speed right at the very beginning, they are being the same size, hitting the same air molecules, they would have the same amount of air resistance. So this is its weight and this is its weight. But I'm hoping you can see that if the air resistance is the same, yet the force of gravity is smaller on the ping pong ball, when you go to figure out the net force divided by mass to get acceleration, the ping pong ball is going to have a smaller net force and therefore a smaller acceleration. And so the whole way down, the ping pong ball always has a smaller acceleration and that results in a smaller uh, speed, except for maybe right at the very beginning. At the very, very beginning, when they're not moving with no air resistance, they each have an acceleration of 9.8. But once they start moving, the ping pong ball has a lower uh, a acceleration. And therefore, and I'm going to go back, which one hits the ground first must be then the, uh, the golf ball. Uh, number nine, uh, which of the following is not a vector? Now, remember, a vector has a magnitude and direction. So hopefully one of the things that we're getting across to you in this beginning part is that quantities in physics, to understand the physical world, uh, we need to you know, talk about the, the quantity. Obviously, there's a difference between force, velocity, and acceleration. Uh, and we need to talk about the units. I mean, obviously, there's a difference between a speed of two... Uh, centimeters per second versus two meters per second. So units are important and the number's important. But one thing that might be new for this class is direction is absolutely important. And things that then fit in that category called vectors. And so this might be the first class you've come across where not just the numbers matter. You did that in a math class. And then the units matter. You probably did that a little bit in a math class and in your some of your physical science classes like in middle school and high school. But now... And depending on your high school, you got to point out that, hey, some things, their direction. And in this case, force is a direction. It does matter if you push something to the left versus to the right or up versus down. You get a different result. And so that is a, a vector quantity. Which way you push it, it does, does matter. Okay. Um, acceleration. Yeah, acceleration, again, matters. Uh, as we talked about, acceleration in the direction you are moving would make you go faster and opposite would make you go slower. So again, which way it accelerates does matter. Now, weight is just a, a force, and so that fits with A. And it's mass here that's the thing that is a, a scalar. It, there is no such thing as my mass is 75 kilograms to the north. Uh, it makes no sense. It doesn't have a direction. So not everything has a direction. Not everything is a vector, but uh, some things are, some things aren't. Uh, acceleration is, forces are, uh, displacement are, those are all nice vectors. But things that are not are like mass or the, the temperature. Uh, you know, that, now that's not to say they don't change. Temperature, you know, could be 22 degrees Celsius and going up, but that doesn't make it a vector. You wouldn't say 22 degrees and north. Uh, that doesn't make anything for the temperature or just a quantity like the number of gallons of gasoline in my car, a scalar. So some things are scalar, some things are vectors. And uh, we need to uh, treat them and think about them a little differently. And so that's the, the physical world we, we live in. And so we want to point out when they're vectors versus when they're, when they're scalars. All right, number, uh, number 10, 
Uh, sounds a little bit like that ping pong ball and golf ball we just did. Here it says two still balls have the same size and shape, but one is hollow. So maybe I'll make a solid one. I'll put a little S there, and then I'll make a hollow one here and put a little H over it for hollow. All right, so we have a solid one, we have a hollow one. They are dropped in air, and their terminal speeds are measured. Which of the following statement is correct? Well, again, let me just draw a longer arrowhead. This one, because it's solid, is going to have a weight that is more than the hollow one. And this discussion goes back to the terminal speed. It reaches its terminal speed when there's no more acceleration. And so that is when the friction, and I'll just put like a giant equal sign, <laughs> and so when the friction equals its weight, and so same thing here, when the friction equals its, its weight. But because they're the same size, they're going to hit the same, I'll call it column of air as they drop through. And this one's going to reach its terminal speed when its frictional force is less than this one. So this one's got to go faster in order to get enough frictional force to equal its, its weight. So this one's going to have a lower terminal speed, and this one's going to have a higher. And uh, so let's see. Uh, they are dropped in air, and their terminal speeds are measured. Which of the following is correct? And so they're looking for a correct one. It says the hollow ball has a smaller terminal speed because it requires a smaller air resistance to cancel the gravitational force. Check mark. Yeah, that all sounded good. Maybe I should just double check. The hollow ball has a larger terminal speed. No, it does not. I'll just stop there. The terminal speeds are the same, no. The terminal speeds are the same, no. And equal to, no, no, that's even the acceleration. So A is the answer there they're looking for here. All right, moving on to 11. Uh, 11 says, uh, two skaters face each other on perfectly smooth ice. One skater has twice the mass of the other. Assuming the bigger skater pushes off the smaller, which of the following statement is true? Now this is beginning to sound to me like a Newton's third law, uh, because it really doesn't matter who pushes whom. Um, when there's a push, and so the bigger push and pushes on the smaller one, the smaller one pushes back with an equal amount of force, so I'll just call it force on each of them. And I'm sure they put them on skates so they could say, let's not worry about the friction between their skates and the ice. And so what we can say is the two objects have the same force. Now, that doesn't mean they have the same acceleration, because remember Newton's second law is net force. That's why we, I can get away with saying the force from their pushes is their net force, because there's no friction here on the skates. Uh, but they, even though they have the same force, they won't have the same acceleration. You can see that uh, there would be a, a two-to-one ratio here because the uh, twice the mass is the, is the larger one. Uh, so getting to what they say here, it says the bigger one won't move. That's not true. Uh, the bigger skater will move with the smaller acceleration. Uh, yes, I'm liking the, the sound of that one. They don't say it's two-to-one. So um, they could have been a little more accurate here with their question, but I think that's it. The bigger skater will move with a larger no. Uh, both skaters will move with the same no. So answer would be B. Now moving on to, to number 12. Uh, it says you're riding in an elevator on the 10th floor of a parking building. Ah, uh, wait, the, you're... Let me get that right. You're riding in an elevator from your 10th floor apartment to the parking garage in the basement. So the key here is you're moving down. Your velocity is down. As you approach the garage, the elevator begins to slow. And I kind of mentioned this on another problem, is that you, uh, in order to, well, do a couple things, to slow down, your acceleration has to be up. And so this would slow you. If it was in the same direction you were moving, you'd go faster. Now, that would be happening if you just jumped out of the elevator, you know, like you were skydiving. You're, you'd be moving down and your force of gravity, your weight would be down, and that'd make you go faster. Oh, we haven't got to one yet, but if it was perpendicular, that would change your direction. But this one clearly says the elevator begins to slow, and that tells you the acceleration then is in the upward. 
Although the question says the net force. And then, of course, coming here to what I wrote down for uh, problem 11, the net force, uh, we, would, we would see that they're saying they're the same direction. So if the acceleration has to be up, the net force has to be up. And so the answer would be B, has to be directed upward. Uh, 13 here says, the uh, in uniform circular motion, and I'll just draw a little circle somewhere. Maybe I can fit it over here. Will that be off? That'll probably be off the screen. I'll go here. So here's my little circle going around. And so I have an object going around. Now, uniform means the same uh, speed. So we're going around at a constant speed. Oh, and it's talking about the acceleration. And so maybe this is going around in a counterclockwise direction. So at this point, it would have a velocity here. But we call this a centripetal because it is inward towards the center of the circle. This is kind of what I was saying back with the elevator, that if the acceleration or the force is perpendicular, you'll change direction. So that's what happens in a circle. You're always changing direction, but you're not changing speed. So there's not a piece of this that makes you go slower or faster. It just always changes your direction. So when it says here the acceleration is parallel or anti-parallel to your velocity, no, that's the part that makes you go faster or slower. And they said uniform, so it wouldn't be that one. The acceleration is perpendicular, absolutely. That's the big one. Acceleration is vertical, while the velocity can be in any direction. Uh, no. Uh, the acceleration is uh, vertical, and the velocity is horizontal. Oh, well, maybe at one point, like when it was at its top here, but that doesn't well describe the whole motion of the of the circle. So B is by far the, the best answer there. And so B, B is in boy. Uh, 14 says we have an airplane flying south. And so it's going south at 40 meters per second. What is the magnitude of the airplane's change in velocity if it later is flying to the west? So I kind of started to make a compass rose here using the uh, standard north is up and let's see, never eat soggy waffles. So there's my compass rose. And so I was trying to say you're heading down in a southerly direction. Well, southerly, I shouldn't say down. On a piece of paper, we draw it down, but south is not down. Uh, down is down and up is up and north and south are not up and down. But anyway, anyway there's six directions. <laughs> north, south, east, west, up, down. Uh, okay, so we're heading south, but then we're going to be going, whoops, I drew east. We're going to be going west 30. So your change would be this. You would You would lose this. So you would go a change of 40 to the north, um, and then you would gain a 30 to the west. And since they're at right angles to each other, we got to use Pythagorean's theorem to figure out how long the, the change is, because that's the, the question here. What, what is the magnitude of the airplane's change in velocity? And we really don't even have to get out our calculator for this. They gave us the three, four, five uh, perfect right triangles. But if you want to, you could say it would be 30 squared plus the 40 squared and the hypotenuse we usually label as C, and you would come up with a with a 50. So there would be D. I mean, yeah, D as in dog. Uh, 15. Uh, says that uh, we have a gun, it's held horizontally, and it's fired. And at the same time, the bullet leaves the barrel. An identical bullet is dropped from the same height. Neglecting air resistance, which bullet hits the ground first? Uh, and this was our long discussion about uh, projectile motion. I hope you caught it in the uh, videos. I had a, a two objects that I let one drop and the other one I gave an initial horizontal speed, but then it was also dropping and it fell and hit the ground at the same time, regardless of how much the horizontal speed was. I did a, a slow speed and then a fast speed and compared it to this one with no horizontal speed. And they all hit the ground at the same time. And so this is trying to say the same thing. Of course, I should point out this is also without air resistance. And so some of you rifle people probably know that, you know, there's the spin of the bullet and the shape of the bullet. And so some of these drop a little bit quicker than, than, than others. Um, and uh, 
got the air effect, kind of like an, an airplane. You know, an airplane would fall if you didn't consider the the effect of the air. Um, but you got to if you want to fly a plane. And so in reality, you, 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 you take into consider that when you're firing a bullet. But that's... So this is maybe more of a theoretical problem, but anyways, I, so I guess the answer is it would it would be a tie. They would they would fall to the ground at the same time. Of course, the bullet would be way over because that would be a huge horizontal speed as it went shooting over here. Um, and and that's really the same logic in sixteen. Here is a bowling ball rolls off the edge of a giant table, and so maybe I'll make this giant table, um, and it's rolling off the edge, and so it has a horizontal speed of 15 meters per second. And of course, then it begins to fall. But it really doesn't matter what its horizontal speed is when it comes to talking about its vertical distance. And that's what this question is. If it takes four seconds for the ball to hit the ground, uh, what is the height of the table? And so we can calculate this in a couple ways. Maybe I'll just grab this equation. This is the equation we said we could use to calculate distance if we know acceleration and time, which we do. It's free falling, so that's roughly 10, and that's 4 seconds, and so we can do that. Remember, this is the one that's only valid if it starts with zero speed, and it does. Now, I will point out it starts off with zero vertical speed. Now, not zero horizontal speed, but that was the whole point of this, this lesson of chapter, I think this is chapter 4, where we could do our projectile uh, motion here. So this should be a one half. This is roughly a 10. And then this is a four uh, squared. And so four squared, 16, half of that's eight. Eight times 10 is 80. And so it looks like we're looking at C here for the uh, answer to how high this table is, which goes back to why they said a giant table. All right, uh, 17, uh, which of the following statements about the moon is correct. Uh, the moon has a constant velocity. Oh, no, not even. Uh, we know that if this is, say, the Earth, the moon goes around, uh, it's ch clearly changing direction. Not even worrying about whether its speed increases or decreases, it changes direction. So it definitely doesn't have a constant velocity. Uh, there is no net force. Well, that wouldn't be true. I mean, if you changed your velocity, you'd have an acceleration, and to have acceleration, you have to have a net force. So can't be B. Uh, C, the Earth exerts a stronger force on the moon than the moon on the Earth. No, they have to be equal. That's Newton's third law. So without even reading it by elimination, I guess, it must be D. Let me just read it here, make sure it sounds good. It says the moon experiences a centripetal acceleration, yep, towards the Earth. And that's back to this, this, this picture. The, the pole is inward, centripetal, as it has a velocity tangential to the circle as it goes around. So definitely uh, D, D is in dog. Ah, here's uh, Newton's universal law of gravity, and this must be getting into chapter 5. What is the acceleration due to the Earth's gravity when you are a distance of one Earth's radii above the Earth's surface? Okay, so if I drew a picture of the Earth and I held an object uh, right above it, we know the acceleration would be uh, roughly 10. I'll call it 9.8. But if you got really far from it, and so it says uh, a distance of one Earth's radii above. And so essentially we've doubled the distance is, is really what this problem is trying to indirectly say. And uh, we know that Newton's universal law of gravity looks something like this. where it depends upon the masses and the distance between them. So comparing when it's on the surface, which gives us a 10, to the force it gets when it's one Earth radii above, uh, we begin to see that uh, the distance has changed. These didn't change. So there is going to be an effect on the force, and therefore an effect on the acceleration. And this number downstairs doubled. And so it went, you might kind of write it this way. You would say it went from R to 2R. So it went from r squared to 2r squared, which is 4r squared. And so if you were to write this then as g m1 m2 over 4r squared, 
uh, you would still have the same parameters. So that's going to give you the acceleration as being at the surface of 10. That's the key to it, but then divided by 4. And so 10 divided by 4 is 2.5. So 18 would be A. Oh, 19. Yeah, I got a couple of emails on this one during the test thinking there was a the typo. There is not. And, and they, there is a common mistake that will give you an answer of 200. And uh, fortunately, that's not one of the options. So if you make that common mistake, you'll kind of pause and go, ooh, uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong, and you'll go back and relook at it. Or you'll think there's a typo, and you'll send me a, a, an email. Um, but this one probably, let me work on the back of, of here so I can have a, a bigger uh, drawing for, for this one here. Because there's something here you, you kind of need to see. Um, it says, uh, this astronaut, Skip Parsec, visits planet uh, MSU-8. Uh, which is composed of the same material as the Earth, but is twice the radius. Now, if we go back to the universal law of gravity... And maybe we draw the Earth in good old astronaut here. And then we put good old Skip on this MSU-8. By the way, there's a reason. There's an 8 in the name of this planet. And you put him on this planet... So Skip here is definitely further away, further away by a factor of two, which kind of brings us back into problem 18. You'll say, oh, okay, so the denominator here becomes 2r squared, and so there's a 4r squared, and that's, of course, a reduction by a, by a factor of, of 4. But that's not the whole problem. If, you, if that's all you did, you would probably take then this 800 and divide it by 4 and get 200 and then look for the answer and go, oh, wait, wait a minute, uh, there, that, that answer's not there. Uh, that's because we're not done because this planet got bigger and so not only the distance increased, but the amount of mass of that planet increased. So I'll put the G and the mass for skip the same but now we need to think about the mass of the planet. It, too, changed by, and there's my question, how much did the mass of the planet change? And this might be a little bit easier to see in blocks. So I like to draw maybe a block like this, and then a block that's twice the, the length. And so maybe it looks like this, twice the height, and twice the depth. How many blocks could you fit in here? And maybe you could see. That you could get. Two blocks. Along its base. And two more. On its height and so that's four and then the same thing would happen then back but behind it because there's two deep here so there's eight blocks see msu8 so the mass here is eight times what it was before so we would have eight times g m1 m2 and so all of this is what we had on earth so that's the 800 and then 8 divided by 4 is a 2, so we have 2 times 800, and that makes 1,600. And so number 19, the correct answer is C. Uh, the uh, weight gets bigger because, again, the mass of the planet gets bigger in a larger uh, numerical factor than the distance you get from it. And that's the thing that you could easily uh, overlook.
And so two things are changing, and that's what makes it a hard problem. All right. So I think that might be the hardest one on the on the test. Uh, keep going on with these multiple choice here. Uh, number 20. Uh, here it says the highest high tides and the lowest low tides occur when the moon is. And so that discussion on tides, if this is the earth, there's an effect because of the earth and because of the moon. And so when they are in alignment, and so if the sun and the moon look kind of like this, both of them will pull a bulge of water towards them. They will also pull the earth away from the water, leaving a bulge over there. And so you will get your two high tides. And so this will be a bulge of water. So when the, as we spin around the earth, this will be high tide. This will be high tide 12 hours later. Well, roughly, because the moon will move a little bit when that 12 hours, it's like uh, 12 hours and 25 minutes. Um, and then of course, in between that will be the, the low tides. Uh, of course, the other thing to, to remember here is that this would also work interesting enough to the same effect when the moon is over here because uh, you get the bulge on, on each side. So this is a new moon where all, all we can see from Earth is the backside, and this is a full moon where all we can see from Earth, the Earth is the, uh, a lighted, the lighted side. Um, and so full or noon are, are, are high, 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 high tides, and that would also make low, low tides. Those are always the more interesting ones you, uh, because you can almost see the water move during, uh, you know, maybe an hour or so out on the pier. You can just kind of see, okay, it, it, it's going to be six feet above sea level. Uh, and it was two, well, two's a little bit big for our area, but it maybe was one foot below. And, uh, you know, it changes to seven, uh, seven feet in the next uh, six hours. And it's, it's noticeable. Whereas when the, they're fighting each other, when the moon is here in first quarter and in third quarter, uh, there's really very little little change. It may be there's only a change from high tide. Uh, and so high tide would be a little bit like this, but small bulge because the, the moon dominates, but the moon uh, the sun is kind of fighting it. And so the first and the third quarter, there's not much change. And maybe the water level changes by two feet over the six hours. And it's really hard to notice it even changes. So one week and you hardly notice a change, and the next week and you notice a big change. All right, well, I better keep going here. Uh, 21, uh, which has the greater momentum? Now, momentum is a product of two things, and the key here is the 18-wheeler has a lot of mass, but it's parked, so its velocity is zero, and that'd be zero momentum. And so this was kind of a question to don't confuse momentum with mass. The 18-wheeler has a lot of mass, but it has no momentum if it is just parked. And so anything, even a crawling ant would have more momentum than a parked 18-wheeler. And so here's a Volkswagen rolling down the uh, hill. And so the Volkswagen would have uh, more mo momentum there. All right. Um, and uh, obviously we got into chapter 8 here. Uh, no, 6, sorry, 6. This is momentum. 12-ounce um, boxing gloves, which... It's interesting because they, they sound like they're heavier and they're going to hurt more. But they have more cush. And that's that's the real key. It's the stopping time here. But 12-ounce boxing gloves used in amateur fights hurt less than 6-ounce gloves. In fact, that's why you lose, use gloves. I mean, just a raw fist would hurt a lot more. And maybe even break a hand. And so they uh, you don't uh, have bare knuckle fights or at least in professional boxing and then, uh, i know there's other sports in other countries that uh like to do the bare knuckle fighting but uh, uh at least here in the u.s we do uh, uh gloves but the professionals only have a six ounce gloves and the amateurs and the kids have to have the bigger uh bigger gloves here and again they weigh more but that's that's not the big thing here the, the thing was that the force can be written um, as mass times acceleration, as we learned earlier. But in this chapter, we learned that that can also be written as change in momentum over the time. And so if somebody throws a, a punch with a, with a, with a heavier one, uh, the change in momentum may actually be a little bit more, but it cushes in and takes a longer time to, to, to stop here. And so that's the idea that the, uh, let's see, the, uh, hurt less than the six ounce glove used by professional because the uh, and the increase in stopping time so this number's big increase means a smaller 
remember the denominator is big, this is smaller, smaller for us. So I guess that would be A there. An increase in time makes a smaller for us. And of course, rearranging this equation is what number 23 is about. It says, which of the following will cause a greater change in momentum? So change in momentum would be force multiplied by how much time? And so you could have a small force for a long time to get a big change in momentum. Uh, kind of like, I don't know, a good analogy might be uh, a car where you barely step on the gas, so there's not much force, but you have it for a long time, you can eventually get up to 60 miles an hour. On the other hand, you could really stomp on the gas and have a big force, and it just takes a short amount of time to get, get to 60 miles an hour. So your change in momentum is not just dependent upon the force, it is a combination of the force and the change in time. And so it says, which of them will cause the largest change in momentum? Uh, a force of blank acting for a time of blank. And so it's, the product would be the greatest, and it looks like C, it gives me a 25. That's a, a 20, an 18, and an 18. So C is the biggest one. Uh, and then finally it says two air track gliders are held together with a string. So maybe I'll just draw maybe this is the track. Um, um, I used in class uh, the little carts that um, aren't on an air track. They just have those low uh, friction wheels. So they work pretty good. Uh, may, not quite as good as ones that are on these air tracks where they it blows air and the, the cart just hovers there and blows up and there really is no touching. Although there is some air resistance. So it's not completely frictionless free, but it's more friction free compared to the ones uh, I have to use. Um, but it says that these two gliders are held together with a string. So there's a string connecting them together. The mass of glider A, so let's call this A, and it has twice the mass of glider B, which we'll just say is M. Uh, and then a spring is compressed between them. And so this would be like the plunger I did on the video here. Um, it's compressed between them. If the gliders are initially at rest, so that means initially at rest, there's no momentum when you include both of them. The string is then released by burning the string. So we uh, sever that string with a little match or something. What is the total momentum? So the key here is momentum is conserved. So if it had zero before you release them, you're going to have zero after you release them, period. Um, now, you get that, of course, because this one goes away and has a negative momentum, and this one goes away and has a positive momentum. So, positive and negative. If they're the same magnitude, add up to zero. And that's what's going to happen. This will have twice the mass but half the speed compared to that one. And so, the negative momentum of A is equal to the positive momentum of B. And the total, then, if you put them together, is, is zero. Conservation of momentum. All right, so there's the, the first half, and, and know that they're, they're graded on two points each. So uh, the most you, you could have gotten is 48 out of uh, the, the that so far. And just take away two for every one you missed. There's really no partial credits for that one. Uh, but now let's go on to the free response question. Here's the uh, the first one. And uh, maybe I'll move this up to the, to the top so I can get a piece of paper here. This is going to take some work here. Um, you might even uh, see that 25 and 26 uh, right out of chapter two, and they 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 really go uh, hand in hand in hand. Um, you'll you'll see that here in a second. But this is kind of like the one we talked about earlier. It says a rock is released from rest. So since it's released from rest, we can use that one. Um, and neglecting air friction, so we know that that's roughly a 10, how far does it fall? And so one half times 10 and for five seconds. Maybe I should put meters per second squared. Uh, so this would be what? 25 when I square it. Uh, half of that is 12 and a half. And then times 10 makes 125. And the second squared would cancel off, leaving me with 125 meters. Now, if you want to do the 9.8, that's fine. I don't really care one way or the other. I'm looking for some logic. But I'll go 1 half times 9.8 times 5 
square, and it'll be a little bit less. And so if you want to get 122.5 meters, that's good too. Uh, just looking for something like that. Now, of course, there's another way to, to do this problem. You could say distance is equal to their average speed multiplied by time. Uh, now, the average speed would be starting at rest, it's zero. And then after five seconds, remember it increases by 10 every second, so 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. This would be 15, so if I divide that by 2 and put my units of meters per second, and then of course put my time of 5 seconds, I'm going to have an average speed of 25 meters per second for 5 seconds, which comes out to be 125 meters. And so that's another option, and either one is, is perfect and valid. Um, and as you might have recalled from the video lecture, I kind of like this one because this one always works. This one we can only use if the initial speed is, is zero. And in that case, it's, it, it, it fits for this problem. So maybe for this problem, this one's better. But you got to remember when and when not to use this one, whereas this one's always true. See, because that's how number uh, 26 is. Let me get rid of this and put over here for number uh, 26. But... Uh, 26 says this, that a bike is traveling at a speed of 9 meters per second and then slows uniform uh, with a uniform acceleration to 3 meters per second. Right. And it does this in 6 seconds. How far does it travel during this 6 seconds? So we do not at all want to use that equation. It's not valid. It does not start at rest, does not finish at rest, never was at rest. So that one's not a, a appropriate, but, but the other one still is. And so we know it starts at nine and slows to three. So if we add them together and divide by two, we're gonna get its average speed and for six seconds. Uh, so nine and three make 12 divided by two is a six. So it's got an average speed of six meters per second for, whoops, six seconds. And so that is 36, and then seconds cancel off, and 36 meters. So that's kind of the idea there. Um, the next one, I think, is Chapter 3, because that was uh, the first two problems from Chapter 2. Uh, let's read it here, number 27. What does it say here? Yeah, it says... Uh, when a force of 20 newtons is applied to a 1.5 kilogram textbook on a flat table, it slides across the table at a constant speed. Uh, keep that in mind. How much force must be applied to make the textbook accelerate at 3 meters per second? Now, Newton's second law says this, that the net force is mass times acceleration. And they just directly gave us the mass, 1.5 kilograms and the acceleration of 3 meters per second squared. So this comes out to be 4.5 newtons. Now don't stop there, though, because that's the, the net force, and it's real tempting to, to stop there. That's not what the question asked. Uh, everything I've done is right, but let's do that free body diagram thing again here, because here's the book sitting on the table... And see, I would have to push it with this force, and then there would be some friction. So if I only pushed it with a force of 4.5, then when I subtract off the, the friction, I would have a net force that is less than that, and I wouldn't get an acceleration of 3. So uh, this, uh, like I said, this is this calculation does not give you the force from the, the person. That it gives you the net force. It gives you the combination of the two. And that's where the other key in this came from, because earlier on, it said at a constant speed. So what that would tell me is when I was pushing with 20, my net force must have came out to be zero to give me a constant speed. So that means the friction must be 20. And so the second half of this problem is to then say, well, the net force is a force I apply minus the friction. 
And the net force is this four and a half newtons that we just calculated. I'm looking for the force I have to apply. And the constant speed part of it was a way of saying that that is how I know how much friction there would be. And so to finish this problem, I would have to move the 20 over to here. And so I would have to push with a force of 20 point, uh, 24.5 newtons. And now it makes more sense. If you push over here with 24.5 newtons, and there is a friction or a backward push of 20, the two together give a net force of, <coughs> excuse me, of four and a half, and then a net force of four and a half divided by a mass of 1.5 give you an acceleration of three. So don't stop halfway. Uh, this is one of those problems I said in my email that, you know, I may grade it and you may get one and a half points for it because you might have done half the problem and then didn't do this, this, this other half. And that's, um, I'll put a one here so I keep track of it, but that's common. All right, so I'll go over here, uh, page two, and then what, what number are we on now? 28. And I think 28's a lot like this one. Yeah, see, we got, again, some friction sliding down. We got a child. A uh, child is accelerating at two meters per second, slides down this gym pole, and so I'll just kind of make this, this pole, and uh, maybe there's this child, what does the child's arm look like, hugging the pole, uh, her legs maybe hugging it also, and so here's the terrible looking child <laughs> going down the, the pole. <clears throat> and again, the first part is the easy one in attempting to stop here. But to get the net force, you would go mass times acceleration. So the mass of the child is 40 kilograms, and the acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. And, of course, 2 times 40 is 80 newtons. So that's the net force. But that's not what this question asks. The question asks, what is the force of friction? So, again, that's where we got to come into the free body diagram. And if we maybe just draw the child hugging the pole, the arms and legs, uh, the child being pulled down by gravity, mg, and being pushed up by the friction. And so this free body diagram would say then that the net force is gravity, mg, pulling the child down, and then the friction pulling it up. And we just did this one in what I call the first half of the problem. And like I said, don't don't stop there, uh, because that you know it's worth one and a half point. You you did half of it, uh, but there's the eighty newtons. Uh, now, what makes this problem a little bit harder? So I do think twenty eight is harder than twenty seven. Is uh, we've got to kind of remember that this is the other force, the force of gravity, and it would be mg, and so this would be forty. And you can round this to a 10 if you want, that's, that's fine. Or you can do the 9.8, that's fine also. And so 80 here, and then this would be 400. And if I put my units, that's kilogram meter per second squared, so that's newtons, minus the force of friction. Move the force of friction over here, and so this would be 400 minus the 80. And so the force of friction must be 320 newtons. And when you put it in, hopefully that makes sense. Pulling down is 400. Uh, lifting back up is 320. The difference between those is 80. A net force of 80 divided by a mass of 4D would give me an acceleration of 2 meters uh, per second. Now, I suppose if you want, we can do the 9.8 in here. And so this number would be 40 times 9.8. And so that's 392. Uh, then when we subtract the 80, uh, we're looking at 312 newtons. And that, that's fine, too. Again, it wasn't so much about the exact number, but the understanding of Newton's second law and the difference between uh, forces and the net force. And then, of course, this is a weight and a friction and a net force. And so those are the two big pieces of that one. 
Ah, now we get into our two-dimensional motion, our projectile motion. Here we have a, a soccer ball. And so I'll just make a soccer ball, a little pentagon there. <laughs> That'd be maybe the best style. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I won't try to draw a bunch of hexagons off that. All right, so here's my, my soccer ball. So my soccer ball is kicked with a horizontal speed. So it's heading this way at 15 meters per second. Uh, but at the same time, it is heading up at 12 meters per second. So it has both a horizontal and a vertical speed. And so that's why the soccer ball would really be looking like this. And so it's going to fly through the air, something like that, as the speeds change. And I, 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 mean, I shouldn't say speeds, plural, because the velocity in the horizontal direction doesn't change. It's the speed in the vertical direction that changes by the 9.8 or the 10 meters per second. So it says, what is the horizontal speed and the vertical speed one second later? Well, okay, there's the answer. The horizontal speed would be 15. Now, the vertical speed would slow down by 10, and so it would be going 2 meters per second. Or if you wanted to use the 9.8, what does that make it? 2.2 .2 meters per second. And so that would be the uh, speed. Let me see if I can squeeze this 30 on there because I think 30, yeah, see 30 uh, continues on with 29, it says, using the information from the problem we just did, 29, how far horizontally and vertically is the soccer ball uh, from the kicker after one second? So we are just going to apply this equation that we did earlier on in this test, which we learned back in chapter two. We're just going to do it twice. We're going to do it once for horizontal motion and once for vertical motion. So I, I hope what I got across in the in the video lectures was this is kind of the neat thing about two-dimensional motion is we're not really learning anything new. We just have to do uh, t to do two-dimensional motion. We just do one-dimensional motion twice. And so maybe here I'll just put horizontal and for this calculation I'll put vertical. Okay, so for horizontal, let's see, it starts at 15, and it's still going at 15, and it did this for one second. So it averaged 15 for one second, means it's going to go 15 meters. Good. Now, vertically, it started at 12, and one second later, it has 2, and traveled for one second. So 14 divided by 2 is 7 meters per second. So it has an average of seven. So its vertical distance would be uh, seven. So it'd be uh, 15 meters over and seven meters up in the, up in the air. Okay. So uh, two, and I, maybe I should point out two parts. So hopefully you answered it both. Uh, um, you know, if you only answered one of them, I guess it's one and a half, but there's two calculations. And the vertical one's the harder one. The vertical one, the speed changes. Although at least, you know, it's not a given that you were going to know the horizontal one, but hopefully you got both of them. All right, well, getting closer to the end here. Uh, let's try number 31. And 31 says that we have a two and a half kilogram eagle uh, and is flying in a circle of a radius of 12 meters with a speed of eight meters per second. What is the centripetal force on the eagle? Now, before this chapter, we learned that F equals MA, or at least net force. And that does equal the force if that's the only thing on it. Okay. And then we learned that there would be a V squared over R would be the acceleration as you turn in a, in a circle. Um, and so this one really is just putting the numbers into this, this equation here. Uh, but hopefully you remember where this equation came from. So this would be a two and a half kilogram mass 
uh, flying with a speed of 8 meters per second squared at a radius of 12 meters. So it looks like I'll probably need a calculator for this one. This is the 2.5 times the 8 uh, squared, and then divided by the 12 comes out to be a 13.3. And if you look here at the units, you'd have kilogram, and it looks like meters squared, but one of them is going to cancel. So it's kilogram meter per second squared. That's the definition of a Newton. And so 13.3 Newtons. And uh, no, no second part or anything to that one. Ah, here's one from the uh, Universal Law of Gravity. Um, this is the force between two objects, which is this gravitational constant, the universal gravitational constant, the mass of each of them, and divided by the distance from their center squared. And so one of the things you're, you're going to need to do here is know that number, or it's open book here, so hopefully you just kind of looked up that number. But another piece of that is to be careful with the units uh, that is given in units of meters and kilograms. So as long as your distance and masses are in meters and kilograms, it works out. But in this case, the distance is not in meters, although the mass is in kilograms. So we won't have to worry about the, uh, the, the mass uh, is here. Uh, the first one is the sun. 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms. And the other object, Jupiter, was 1.9 times 10 to the 27th. I hope you can read that. That was kind of tight there. But here's the, the real catcher, is make sure you put the distance in meters and so right there, 10 to the 8th, and then a kilometer would be times 1,000. And so it's 10 to the 8th kilometers. A right, kilo is 1,000. And, of course, then you just add exponents. So that's 10 to the 11th squared. All right. So that's going to take some calculator work here. And so 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th times 1.9 times 10 to the 27 and divided by 7.78 times 10 to the 11th quantity squared equals... And it looks like I got 4.17 times 10 to the 23rd. And, of course, this is why it was so important with the units. Meters would cancel off with meters, kilograms with uh, kilograms, and we would have then newtons uh, left over. So that's, the, that's the, the big piece there. So it's Newton's universal law of gravity and a little bit of careful with your units. All right, getting to the last two on uh, chapter six and momentum. It says a 1.5, so 1.5 kilogram ball of sticky clay is thrown at a speed of six meters per second at a moving three kilogram cart. So here's the cart that has a mass of three kilograms. The cart is moving towards the clay at a speed of 2 meters per second. If the clay and the cart stick together, when they hit each other, uh, what is the speed and the direction of the clay cart after the collision? So this is the one that I'm saying I find it easier to kind of make two columns and say, okay, well, what is my total momentum before? Because it's going to be the same as after. So before I have a 1.5 kilograms and a 6, and I have to add it to the other object. And here's where you got to be a little careful. It's 3, but its speed is in the negative 2. So that is the whole idea that the momentum uh, can be positive and negative. kind of reminds me of the uh, multiple choice one, the last one where the carts went in opposite directions. So we had a positive and a 
and a negative. So that's how I calculated before. And then that has to equal to afterwards. Now afterwards, if they stick together, I can think of it as one object now, um, where the mass is the sum of the two together. So it's the three kilograms and the 1.5, and it's moving then with some speed v. Uh, so if I come over here, this would be a 9 minus a 6, which makes it a 3. Um, and that must, oh, it came out to a nice even 2 thirds. And I'll maybe I'll just write it as 0.66 repeating meters per second for the uh, velocity. Yeah, that's kind of nice. Um, then, but it's a positive velocity. And so positive is the, this direction. So what is its speed? There's its speed. What is its direction? Uh, I guess I'll say uh, the direction would be the same as the clay was thrown. How about that? <laughs> and so that's going to be the, the, the direction of the, because uh, it's, it's, it's a positive. And, but oh, by the way, we could have switched these and then, of course, we would have given a negative speed to the clay and then we would have come up with a negative one. So we still would agree that it's in the direction of the clay. The plus and minus is just a mathematical convention, but we would all agree it would go in the, the direction of the, of the clay. All right, and then finally, and last one, number 34. And again, it's another momentum one here and a conservation of momentum. I'll make my little chart here. Here is the before and uh, here is the after. And in this case, we have a rubber ball. It's a 0.75 kilogram rubber ball and it's thrown at this cart that is initially stationary. Now, it's a four-kilogram cart, but stationary. Um, the rubber ball hits the cart with a speed, so it's thrown pretty fast, 15 meters per second, and then bounces off. So I'll, I'll hold off on my picture on that. But the before then would be 0.75 for the mass of the rubber ball and a speed of 15 and the cart would have a mass of four well maybe i'll put it in there four but times a speed of zero so that's how i'd calculate the momentum before um, now afterwards maybe i'll draw the picture down here afterwards it it has the rubber ball so the 0.75 uh, what does it say? It bounces, um, let's see, 15 minutes from now, bounces off the cart, traveling back to the thrower at a speed of 7. So, speed of 7 meters per second. And so, remember up here then, I'm going to put its momentum of 0.75 times a negative 7 plus and the cart, whatever the cart is. Now, the cart is still going to have a mass of 4 kilograms, so I'll put a 4 kilograms in my picture, but it's going to be moving with some unknown speed, V, and that's the question. What is the speed of the cart after the rubber ball bounces off? And so the key to the problem is to say, okay, you calculate the momentum of the two before, and if you calculate the momentum of the two after, they, they have to be equal. Um, now... Let's see, 0. 0.75 times 15, this comes out to be 11.25. And this over here, 0. 0.75 times a negative 7, comes out to be a negative 5.25 plus 4V. And so when you bring this over to here, let's see, 11 and 5 make 16. So that's 16.5 equals to 4V. And then 16.5 divided by 4 is 4.125V. And the units would be meters per second. And you need to make sure you finish your answer with units. 
Um, but I should also have been a little careful. This would be kilogram meters per second there, uh, kilogram meters per second, and the four would be a kilogram. So when I bring it over and divide, the kilograms cancel off. So kilograms here cancels with kilograms there, and you're left with uh, meters per second. And that's it. That's the test. All right. Hope you did well. I'll start grading them uh, this weekend.